Welcome to the ONC 2022 Tech Forum Breakout Session, Real World Implementations and Innovation Through LEAP. My name is Thomas J. Brown with Kaufman and Associates, and will be assisting with the logistical support for this Zoom session. To provide comments or ask questions, please open the chat box, which is located toward the bottom part of your screen. Click on the talk bubble icon, and this will pull up the chat box to the right side of your Zoom interface. Additionally, we ask that you select the speaker view option located at the top right side of your Zoom interface. This will allow you to, allow you to see the speaker as they present or share information. If you need technical assistance during the session, please type the issue into the chat box and one of our techs will respond to you. Please be aware that today's session is being recorded. The session recordings will be available on the Tech Forum platform within a few days. The recording will be available to view on demand for one year. The slide deck shared in this session will be available on the Tech Forum platform within the next few weeks. Finally, closed captioning is available by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. I will now turn it over to Allison Kemp. Welcome to the Real World Implementations and Innovation Through the Leading Edge Acceleration product, Projects Breakout Session, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Allison Kemp, and I am a Public Health Analyst at ONC, and together with Wei Chang, the ONC Manager of the LEAP Program, we will be moderating this session. Please put your questions in the chat, and we will answer those after the presentations. Wei will first present an overview of the LEAP program, which will be followed by presentations from three current LEAP grantees, the University of Texas at Austin, the Missouri Department of Mental Health, and Dartnet Institute. Over to you, Wei. Thank you, Allison, for kicking us off. And I would like to see maybe um, is the slide ready for sharing as well. Thank you. Um, so welcome everyone to the LEAP session. And today um, I like to first kick us off, um, like Allison mentioned with a brief overview of the LEAP program. Next slide, please. So um, at a very high level, keeping in mind, um, we have our three awardees here. I don't want to take up too much of the time, but at a very high level, I like to give a background, some background on the LEAP program, talk about some of the projects that have been part of LEAP since its inception in 2018, and then turn it over to talk briefly about the LEAP areas of interest for the current fiscal year. Next slide. So. To give a very um, high level background, um, in 2010, through the High Tech Act, um, the SHARP program, which some of you might be familiar with, was created to support um, advanced research activities and address both short term and long term challenges to the implementation of high tech. And with a focus particularly on solving challenges to the adoption and meaningful use of health IT. And since the High Tech Act was enacted and the SHARP program was created, the healthcare ecosystem um, and the technology supporting it have evolved rapidly. And as the electronic exchange of health information has matured, the amount and types of data available has expanded dramatically. And data standards set, such as HL7 Fire, as well as APIs are making it easier for consumers to access and share their health data with providers and allow health system to really integrate desperate data sources. And with the passage of Curious Act, um, that really strengthened ONC's mandate to improve the interoperability of health information and was really pivotal in um, laying the foundation for our nation's potential to innovate in areas such as facilitating information exchange, addressing barriers to interoperability, as well as enhancing patient access to their information. But while working with to implement the Curious Act provisions, ONC has identified um, opportunities with respect to leveraging EHR data to support population level analyses and serve um, services, as well as integrating new knowledge into routine clinical care. And the reasons for these opportunities range from data standards and interoperability, digitization, integration, 
to presentation of new evidence into clinical workflows in a safe, useful, and useful ways. And as a result of identifying these um, challenges and opportunities, LEAP was established in 2018 as a funding opportunity to support innovative and breakthrough solutions that are critical to maximizing the potential of health IT. And each year since 2018, ONC has filed a call for proposals, encouraging new generation of health IT development and refining and implementing relevant standards, methods, and tools. So there have been a 10 lead projects total since 2018, and we'll have a chance to hear from three of them today. Next slide, please. So um, as I have mentioned, uh, each year since 2018, um, ONC has identified new areas of interest that align with ONC priorities. And usually there is one award per area of interest and up to $1 million per award. Um, it is a cooperative agreement program with significant input from ONC and collaboration with awardees. The period of performance is two years with the potential to Expand, extend that up to a five-year period based on funding as well as ONC priorities. Next slide. So to give a very high-level overview of the 10 projects that have been part of the LEAP program since the start in 2018, I will quickly touch on some of them and with understanding that we'll hear from three of them more in depth today. So in 2018, the first area of interest was uh, standardization and implementation of scalable HL7 fire consent resource. And the project was uh, population level data focused um, with Boston Children's Hospital. And the team built um, prototyped an app called Smart Pop Health that demonstrated the power of a shared view of EHR data between healthcare provider organizations and payers such as Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurers. And then in area two, which is MedStar Health Research Institute, the area of interest was advancing clinical knowledge at the point of care, which resulted in a cardiovascular disease risk calculator into that was integrated into the MedStar Health Electronic Health Record System to optimize clinical workflow, improve care coordination, and support patient engagement. Then in 2019, um, the first area of interest was standardization and implementation of scalable HL7 fire consent resource, and that was the awardee was San Diego Regional HIE. Um, and what they did was create a fire-based platform that simplifies consent management and ensures interoperable services. And then in area two, which um, you will get to hear from today, um, from the team at UT Austin, the area of interest was to design, develop, and demonstrate um, enhanced patient engagement technologies for care and research. Then in 2020, we had um, three areas of interest. The first area of interest was advancing registry infrastructure for a modern API-based health IT ecosystem. And working with um, CRISP and the American College of Cardiology, um, this project really focused on streamlining the process for healthcare providers submitting patient data, especially registry data. And the goal was to modernize the health IT ecosystem for the benefit of clinical registries and those seeking to use clinical data to improve care decisions. Then area two, we had two uh, projects. One is with Boston Children's Hospital and the other with MedStart Health. But this area of interest focused on cutting edge health IT tools for scaling health research. And for Boston Children's, they focused on bulk data to support an ecosystem for research and learning that's called Cumulus. And MedStart Health 
um, their project really focused on understanding the current state of open source healthy health IT tools through a rigorous evaluation, including environmental scan, stakeholder interviews, as well as usability evaluations. And the purpose for that is to really prioritize critical needs for future open source health IT tools. Then in area three um, was uh, Missouri Department of Mental Health, which we'll also get to hear from today, um, but their area of interest focused on integrating healthcare and human services data to support improved outcomes. And finally, um, the latest round um, of awardees in 2021 um, was area one, which is referral management to address social determinants of health aligned with clinical care, and that is um, UT Austin. And then the second area of interest in 2021 was health IT tools to make um, EHR data research and artificial intelligence ready. Great. So um, the latest uh, cycle of LEAP um, applications focused on two areas of interest. The first one um, that you see on the screen on the left is to really aim at adoption and use of SDOH related standards and data in underserved communities and to address disparities and identify some of the challenges and opportunities that are inherent in scaling these solutions across different communities. And the second area of interest um, is focused on um, developing the infrastructure and standards-based PGHD technologies that are needed to demonstrate the scalable use of equity-enhancing patient-generated health data for research from the point of care to the researcher. Next slide. And so in the first area of interest, um, as I mentioned, the objectives um, and the key um, task involve include the collection of and analysis of SGOH data um, in the EHR to identify population level use cases for addressing health disparities, um, closed loop referrals between EHR and appropriate community based organizations, as well as patient facing technology, um, such as web-based platforms and applications that will allow patients to manage their data and provide consent for various purposes. Next slide. Then area two, um, as I mentioned, um, involves uh, patient-generated health data technology solutions that can be comprised of, um, for example, apps, remote monitoring devices, or wearable devices that collect data to monitor and track health outside of clinical care setting. And I'm going to wrap it up there in the interest of leaving time to for our awardees to talk about their projects perspectively, perspective, respect, um, perspectively um, but I, if you want to learn more about the ONC LEAP program, um, there is a link here um, on the slide. And I'm turning it over to Allison to introduce our next speakers. Thank you, Wei. Now we will have Dr. Anjum Kershid and Eliel Oliveira from the University of Texas at Austin present their project. Thank you, Allison. Um, so, and thank you to ONC and the organizers of the Tech Forum for arranging these sessions and giving us an opportunity to share uh, the progress we have made at the University of Texas at Austin on the leading edge acceleration projects. Um, our project focused on developing a, a Fire API based patient engagement technology that fulfills the requirements of the 21st Century Cures Act to allow patients um, to easily access their data without much effort. Uh, because addressing health equity is a key priority for ONC and federal policy, as well as a mission uh, for the Dell Medical School where we, we work, where this research and development took place, we particularly focused uh, on developing these technologies for underserved populations in our community. Next slide, please. So the problem that we were addressing related to the current limitations 
on how easily patients can access or share their own health information uh, for their care, as well as uh, to participate uh, in research uh, that is of their interest. Uh, as you see, due to the fragmentation of healthcare data, uh, bi-directional communication between healthcare providers and patients um, is quite constrained, particularly uh, for certain subpopulations. Uh, the other major issue um, in solving this problem is that existing patient engagement technologies, including um, EHR portals, um, um, have inconsistent design. Many are not necessarily following any, any standards, uh, and they keep changing as providers kind of switch vendors. So all in all, these factors are making it even harder for underserved populations to access their information. Um, and has, as has been recently you know, stated repeatedly, uh, that uh, access to information is a social determinant of health uh, as well. And we have seen that um, uh, in the COVID um, uh, pandemic very often. So, uh, so that's the problem. Now we would have uh, uh, some poll questions to get some feedback from you. Have you ever requested a healthcare organization where you receive care to release your medical records to you for any reason? Let's see. Okay. Seems like everybody has had uh, uh, that experience. I'll give you five more seconds if anybody has not responded. Yeah, maybe we can go to the next question. Some people are just raising their hands. Uh, have you ever used a mobile app to access your medical records from your healthcare provider? Yeah. So it seems like a majority have although almost a third have not. Um, and we could go into more detail in terms of why people uh, are hesitant and sometimes requesting information. Uh, but again, let's also remember that uh, this is not a representative population for what we are trying to address, which is really addressing health equities and addressing the challenges with some underserved populations that uh, may not be attending a webinar like this but yet have health needs. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so the, the solution that kind of we proposed um, to, was to design and develop a standards-based platform. And that was important because we want the platform to be something that is not just proprietary, that was actually a requirement for NC, as well as something that can be scalable and used in other uh, communities as well, but particularly that allows underserved populations in meaningful ways. Uh, to interact with the healthcare system on the one hand for their own needs um, and also for getting involved in clinical research, uh, but also with other types of service providers, uh, which uh, as um, is seen by future um, uh, LEAP projects, uh, includes uh, social service providers, other government providers, service providers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also third-party app developers who also find many barriers to accessing healthcare data. Uh, because once the data are in the hands of the patient, then uh, the legal, legal requirements of sharing that data are reduced because according to our legal system, the patients have a right to their data and can share it as they desire. And the way, next slide please. And the way that we started really thinking about this is again, not just making it easy from the patient side, but also easy in terms of developing a system like this. Uh, and rather than going to each EHR and trying to build linkages, the way that we proposed doing this was to transform EHR clinical data from an, a data aggregator like a health information exchange into national standards like FHIR, and then link it through these um, application programming interfaces, which make the linkage easy to a platform that the users can easily access on their mobile phone 
or via internet. Uh, this minimizes the effort of linking multiple EHRs and tracking where a patient's data might be stored uh, because HIE is kind of a central hub that already link those data. And then uh, as we create uh, QHINs and other regional entities that may be data aggregators, uh, it can help connect these islands of data that currently exist. But this burden is not put on the patient to find out where their data are so they can link it on their, on their app. Next slide, please. And then our, the approach that we use was a three-pronged approach uh, of uh, starting with community engagement, using user-centered design, and then developing a technical solution in that order, uh, but interacting with uh, these three uh, approaches, interacting with each other. And we will tell you more uh, about each one of them. So let's go to the next slide. One of the, I think, uh, unique features of our work was not only to engage community in the more traditional ways of, uh, of creating a community advisory board or having a focus group, um, but actually using an adapted and expanded uh, community engagement studio approach, which was developed a few years ago. Um, uh, in this approach, the community members are not study participants, uh, but rather experts who ask questions of the researchers. So the role is reversed. Um, and, and these community engagement studios then also take place uh, across the duration of the project where community members also review and give feedback um, on features, uh, literacy levels, visuals, user interfaces uh, for these technologies. And in some ways they hold the researchers accountable for the kind of functionality that they want to see in these platforms. So that, uh, that was a, a great experience for us also in terms of how to develop technologies that are facing patients and, and meant for communities, especially underserved communities. And these community engagement studios in order to also take into account uh, differences in, in different subgroups of subpopulations, uh, we used four different uh, uh, groups, demographic groups, Latinx, English speaking, Spanish speaking, African Americans and Asian Americans, and held um, almost 20 sessions throughout this project uh, to get feedback. Many of those sessions were done on Zoom as you see on the slide. And then uh, translating what we learn uh, into the solution that we develop. And for that, Eliel Oliveira will be describing our solution. Eliel, over to you. Yeah, next slide, please. And thanks, Angel. Um, I think I want to highlight here that uh, this happens right when we were in the middle of COVID. Uh, so we were doing most of these sessions remotely, but it was still a great success. Uh, once we, we gathered the feedback from the communities, uh, and halfway through it, we started with our user-centered design work uh, through our healthcare experience lab. And as you can see, the steps here, we went through quite a few. Uh, first, we looked at the industry, uh, doing a competitive analysis, trying to understand the apps out there, the mobile solutions that have kind of the similar features where someone gets access to some data and they are able to share that data with someone else through plugins or you know sub apps that are within a platform. Uh, we, we then joined the CS meetings to kind of hear from the, the, the community what they were saying, review the recordings and notes from those meetings. And that helped us to come up with the scenarios and, and that would help us design uh, what the platform should look like. We did quite a bit of usability tests and one-on-one -on -one interviews with these users as well, so that they can actually try the tools and we see how well they can actually navigate. And that led us to the interactive, iterative designs that allow us to design the final solution. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the background of the, the platform itself that used a few techniques to be able to do this in a research context, right? So the data of the HIE is extensive with uh, millions of patients. And, uh, you know, given our regulations, you can't just tap in that data for research, uh, you know, directly. So what we did then was to transform the data from the HIE as a limited data set under HIPAA, which basically means that only contains dates and zip codes, but all the other PHI is removed. Uh, but then you would, we stage that data and, and transform that data in fire resources. So then it's ready to be used when the patients come in and access the platform. 
But in order for us to be able to match individuals with the data, uh, we needed to have a solution that could do that, preserving the privacy of those individuals. And that's why we use PPRL as a solution to do so. So if an individual downloads the app and signs in with some basic demographics, that information gets hashed and encrypted, and then we are able to match them with their own data, which is already being staged as fire APIs, and then they have access to the information. Um, and once they do so, then we needed to pilot like how individuals can now share those APIs with other app developers so that they can use and try uh, to see some additional functionality. So we tried to, as you see listed here, find help, which is a social services referral platform, and our own you know, do that the, the medical school study app. Uh, and both of these apps basically would ask patients, can I have access to some information from your medical records so we can provide some services? As a quick example, find help would ask for their zip code and then provide them a list of social services in their neighborhood that they could take advantage of. Um, next slide, please. So here you see a few screenshots after the design was done and the infrastructure was put in place. Uh, um, the app is available in the App Store of Apple and Google. Google. Um, I have an article here that you can look at about more details uh, uh, about the infrastructure. But this shows the design of how individuals can access their, uh, their medical records directly and just see the records themselves. But it has some basic functionality like allowing for notifications and yes, allowing individuals to add these plugins like find help and you know others that delivers an additional functionality to individuals. Uh, and, and there's a lot more that can be added here to, if you download the app, you're likely not gonna be able to access it today uh, because it needs to be connected to your data, to your region, to your HIE, uh, but it's a fully functional platform. Next slide, please. So this is some results of the, uh, the real pilot with real patients that will recruit in, in clinical settings uh, in Austin. Um, we try to highlight here in, in uh, orange, red, uh, like negative uh, comments, and then blue and green, the more positive ones. And as you can see, they, they're ranging from not so great uh, to eventually becoming more positive down the road. And, what key thing that happened was when we recruited the first few patients, we noticed that we are not getting them linked to their data with the HIE, and that caused a bit of frustration. Uh, and we learned that the Fire API standard for uh, uh, gender uh, is really different uh, than what the H uh, EHRs and HIEs store for gender. And we had to resolve that to be able to match individuals to their record. Uh, so that's an important feedback to relay nationally is that even though the standards are out there, EHRs and HIEs are not necessarily using that for patient record linkage could become a challenge. But once we solved that problem, we had 100% matching of individuals to their own records. And then we start getting some more positive feedback uh, from the app access. Uh, next slide, please. And I just have a few quotes from patients. I'm not gonna read all of them, but uh, these are helpful to, for you to see. The first one, someone basic, basically saying from how they really love having access to their records and never heard back from some tests they have done, but was able to get those results through the app uh, and not have to spend hours waiting on the phone to, with a nurse to be able to find out because the HIE has HL7 connectivity. It's almost uh, real time that the patients would get lab results on their mobile app. So that was very uh, good to hear from patients. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, again, some more comments here of how someone didn't have the ac access to their records their whole life and could do through maybe an app like this. Um, I won't read those in details, but uh, next slide again. And some recommendations through our learning through this process is that the underserved populations need to be included as co-designers uh, to develop these engagement platforms. It's very important. Uh, the, the things that we learned throughout the process that uh, we, we spent a couple of hours here to share with everyone were tremendous. And we believe, totally believe that it's necessary that they be part of the, the discussions in any project. Uh, uh, and we have made those recommendations to ONC. Um, and of course, standard interoperability and privacy 
uh, protections to, to make this scalable, like we demonstrated using PPIL uh, without infringing anyone's privacy. Um, and, and finally, another recommendation we made is that if we leave to market forces alone to allow for our economy of mobile apps for underserved populations, we're probably not going to get there, uh, you know, and that we need government efforts and support to be able to allow that to happen. I think we, you probably would imagine or see that they, we have a great set of mobile apps for all kinds of things, but they are not necessarily, in our view, helping on the sort of community and just broadening the, the digital divide. Um, with that, I think that's the last slide we have, and we will talk, uh, answer questions at the end. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew and Eliel. Um, next, we will hear from Angie Brenner and Duane Shoemate from the Missouri Department of Mental Health um, who will present their project. Thank you, Allison. Um, I think we can go ahead and skip forward a couple of slides here. Again, there we go. Duane, I will let you start with a little bit of background um, about who we are and, and how we started. Thank you, Angie. So as we begin our presentation, we wanted to provide just a brief overview of, of who the Missouri Division of Developmental Disabilities um, is and kind of the impact uh, that we're, we've had and hoping to have on an ongoing basis uh, for those supported through our program. So with the next slide. Uh, so the Missouri Division of Developmental Disabilities uh, supports approximately 15,000 individuals through home and community-based uh, waiver programming services funded through Medicaid. Uh, we support individuals who range in age from one year to 92 years of age, and supports and services are coordinated by case management agencies in the community, and then services are ultimately delivered by community providers to include clinical settings, uh, residential providers, day and employment agencies, uh, and, uh, and, and private individuals. Uh, the state is transitioning to an online case management system uh, to support operations and billing, and then future um, connectivity uh, and the ability to share records. So this will help uh, our small providers who currently do not use an electronic uh, case management tool. Um, with our next slide. I will turn it back over to Angie. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, so Missouri has been working with CMS and ONC for quite some time now. During April of 2018 through um, August of 2019, Missouri was one of 10 states that participated in the Medicaid Innovation Accelerator Program. And that's a collaboration between the Center for Medicaid and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Um, and really it was to improve health and the healthcare uh, for Medicaid beneficiaries, as well as helping states determine opportunities to reduce um, and avoid some unnecessary costs. Specifically, our focus was about, uh, was learning about value-based payment models, um, data, stakeholder engagement, and the development of a value-based payment model roadmap. So I'm gonna call it a VBP roadmap. Um, our use case during our technical assistance was personal assistance service because um, that was a service that crossed all three of our Medicaid agencies um, with shared waiver participants. After our participation in that technical assistance, we continued to receive technical assistance through ONC. And that is what led us to our LEAP grant. So I'm going to ask you to uh, go to the next slide and we will share with you our uh, first year of um, the ONC LEAP project. Um, in the next slide, please. When ONC presented the, the LEAP grant to us, kind of showed us what this was, um, we went ahead and applied for it. And in Missouri, the LEAP award was really focused on testing and implementing what we call an individual support plan using the national ELTSS standards. So for any of those that are not familiar with an individual support plan, this goes back to what Duane was talking about with a case management system. It is the document that supports um, an individual and their, their support coordinator, their planning team to develop and, and determine what an individual's needs are, 
what their services would be and their supports to help them live successfully in the community. And so that plan includes home and community-based services, um, such as personal assistance, day have, employment. Um, it will include information about medical and nursing needs, which all impacts the individual social determinants of health. So the state and team um, had already done kind of a great job laying out that foundation for the work through some of that technical assistance. And then this LEAP grant was gonna give us the opportunity to continue to figure out how do we capture, aggregate, and share the, the data to support um, our supported employment value-based care model. Next slide, please. On this slide here um, for the LEAP grant, we convened a work group to test the data exchange. And we wanted to share with you our full list of our work group participants. Um, as you can see, we've captured entities from the beginning of entering an individual with developmental disabilities, their services, to receiving their actual employment services, visiting a primary care doctor, gaining and gaining access, sorry, gaining successful employment. Um, this work group worked diligently, um, many weeks, uh, many hours on developing a use case, configuring it to their system and testing the data exchange. And so we were so grateful for their engagement and support. It was the first time that we were able to pull a team like this together. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dwayne to talk a little bit more about our story overview for our use case on the next slide. All right, so if we can go to the uh, next slide. So with growing research evidence focusing on the intersection of employment and health outcomes, our use case focused on the social determinants of health and is representative of holistic care. Uh, our use case focused on an individual with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, and his support coordinator and them sharing information, uh, sharing the ELTSS care plan across different service providers that supports uh, this individual's level of care. Uh, so to do this, um, we um, have been working with FEI to develop our electronic case management system. So in, to do this, what you'll see is that FEI was able to write the ELTSS plan uh, and pass that to patient-centric solutions. Uh, and patient-centric solutions, in turn, uh, was able to push the data to SetWorks, uh, which is our uh, one of our um, IT providers for one of our support employment providers. And then ultimately patient-centric also uh, was to be passing information onto Station MD, uh, representing a primary care facility. And this was uh, done all through the use of FHIR API version four. So that is our use case. So as we go to the next slide, as part of our pilot development process, uh, the participants in this work together to collaboratively develop personas. Uh, the value of developing the persona was to really kind of inform that real world applicability and to maintain a person-centered approach and mapping of the needed data transactions. Uh, additionally, it supported education and messaging to our stakeholders as many are unfamiliar with the technical aspects of data interoperability, uh, electronic health records and fire IG. So as we go to the next slide, uh, what we can see here is that what we did was map out the scenes that occur in a typical episode of care. Uh, the encounters are identified as uh, one of the six scenes uh, that you see on the screen. Um, the actors within each of those scenes were identified, as well as the key actions completed by that actor and then the associated data transaction that needed to occur to accomplish our use uh, case. This enabled us to easily map the exchange of information which would be needed in the resulting mapping of data transactions. And uh, with that, I will pass it back to Angie to kind of talk about how we were able to demonstrate this in the Connectathon. Yeah, thank you, Dwayne. So we did demonstrate this with, our, with the Connectathon that we participated in, and we have the recording on our website. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, we will share that recording, but in the meantime, if you if you want to see it, we can share that. In the meantime, we're going to share a couple of screenshots with you so you can see what it looks like. So on the next slide, you will see um, screenshots from different solutions and, and data that participated in the testing. On the left, we have our use case management system that was presented by our, ven our vendor FEI systems. And on the right, you can see patient-centric solutions who served as our health information exchange actor. 
you can see the individuals, you can see Henry's um, personal information and goals um, in their plan as it moves from that case management system to the health information exchange. On the next slide, you will see screenshots as Dwayne was talking about where it goes from SetWorks, which is on the left, to the supported employment provider IT system on the right, um, and to Station MD, which was our primary care provider with the electronic health record. Both of our vendors uh, demonstrated the receipt of the ELTSS data elements and showed how Henry's care plan moved from one, um, one entity to the next, informing his care overall. So on the next slide, um, we're gonna kind of start talking about our demonstration highlights. Um, we wanted to make sure through that demonstration that we captured the highlights um, that we heard from all perspectives. So as we mentioned before, we engaged a diverse set of stakeholders across um, our spectrum between our home and community-based services as well as medical care. Our demonstration track included presentations from clinical, non-clinical providers, home and community-based service, um, services from waiver program staff and Office of National Coordinator of Health IT, ONC. They shared their perspective as well, which was extremely helpful. Um, the focus at all levels really was on the person-centered planning process. The IDD population, individuals with developmental disabilities, they can often have, have issues recalling information as they go to the doctor's office, as they go to their, their home and community-based providers. They may have difficulty communicating information. It can be challenging for them. So the providers that were engaged in this project were really excited about the opportunity for sharing that ELTSS data plan across the system facilities. It, it enabled them to provide better care at a quicker, quicker pace. On the next slide, we have a few more um, technical highlights. It, um, the, we were focusing on implementing the more mature fire IG. What we saw was that cross-facility exchange. Um, vendors were able to use multiple fire API vendors. Um, there were multiple provider types. We had some push and some pull of the data. And again, if you're able to um, check out the link um, to the demonstration, you'll be able to see how that push and pull occurred. We demonstrated the clinical value to each collaborator. And the nice thing was, is that a lot of this was new to our vendors, our providers. Um, so the new fire implementers found it easy to understand and implement um, just in addition to that high value add to their target users. So on the next slide, we, we wanted to quote some of the feedback that we received. And there was a lot of eagerness to put this into production. Again, this, is, this has not been um, implemented um, anywhere yet in the nation. So um, very first here trying to test this out. So there's a lot of excitement to, to put this into production. And um, you can see they're like, let's do this now. This was transformational for our providers, clients, budgets. Um, what we saw that what we saw was that it provides efficiency, um, improving quality of service. It was time saving, it was easy to use and really having access to that data quickly when we needed to have informed care. So on the next slide, we'll start digging into, we are in our final year of the LEAP grant. We actually wrap up here in the next week or so. Um, and so we have a list of some of our accomplishments. Um, what we've done is we've reviewed and analyzed and we've developed cost proposals for implementation. We've disseminated findings to, to stakeholders and we also have those posted on our website. Um, we've secured funding um, through our General Assembly and the HCBS um, Enhanced Spend Plan opportunity that we have through 9817. Um, and we're working to finalize transitioning that use case into production. We've developed a VBP roadmap and an implementation plan. Um, we've also worked with a work, our work group to develop and test a provider self-assessment tool for VBP readiness. And as I mentioned, we did um, secure some funding. So we're excited that our General Assembly passed additional funding in our state fiscal year 23 budget to leverage the home and community-based enhanced FMAP funding um, by approving $36.5 million in value-based payment efforts. <coughs> Excuse me. And this includes outcome-based incentive payments, workforce recruitment incentives and retention, as well as the VBP information technology that we've shared with you today to expand much of our efforts, excuse me, <coughs> to expand much of our efforts that we worked on through the LEAP grant. 
Um, <clears throat> oh my gosh, I apologize. So the VBP IT effort <coughs> include research and planning for <laughs> additional health IT tools and capabilities, um, enhancing our case management system to add non-waiver programs, um, incorporating the interoperability system enhancements into our case management project. We, um, it also includes the support of our state case management system to put our specific lead grant use case into production. We are also able to provide some grant funding for our home and community-based providers to onboard and have interfaces with health information networks, um, looking to support exchanging screening and assessment data, and then supporting our providers, our home and community-based providers for IT system adoption. So as, as Dwayne spoke about earlier, many of them are, are paper-based. So we wanna have an opportunity to help them enhance their systems as well so they can connect to the health information networks and have data interoperability. <clears throat> Some additional um, opportunities that came up for us, we have on our next slide. Um, through our LEAP grant stakeholder engagement, We've engaged in a, project, in a project with our Missouri Hospital Association to begin receiving admission discharge um, data. We've also partnered with our state Medicaid agency to onboard home and community-based providers to health information networks. And on the next slide, we have a few more details about the success of that onboarding program. We had um, our health information networks reported that there's 547 locations um, based off of the 93 entities that they have onboarded with the Medicaid agency and the health information networks. Um, the success really in that that we did not anticipate was that there was there were several providers that had never participated at all in health information ex, um, exchanges that were able to join. Um, and we did have a few, not a lot, but more than we anticipated of our home and community based service providers. Um, to onboard with the health information exchanges. And so that was very exciting because when we first started this project, <coughs> our home and community-based providers did not know anything about health information networks and our health information networks and exchanges did not know anything about our home and community-based providers. So that was a significant success for us. <coughs> On the next slide, um, we have some opportunities for us to move forward. And we're going to continue to work to secure funding and finalize moving the use case into production. I think one of the things for us is that this has not been done in the, in the nation before, and there's a lot to learn about the ELTSS data set and the implementation um, and development of that, of those, um, those, those data elements that the, we're learning a lot about the market demand and the cost for those and how to actually put those into the system. So we will continue to work on securing funding, additional funding and moving that in there. And we'll um, continue to develop and implement, implement our um, value-based payment roadmap. That's gonna be a continual update and change as we move through this process. And then we do want to continue to identify those opportunities to align with data infrastructure, infrastructure and operability, interoperability efforts with partner agencies and stakeholders, just like we did with Missouri Hospital Association, um, with our Medicaid agency and our Missouri Health Information Networks. And we're hoping that all the information that we've laid out here today will help other states um, move in that same direction. So we're always happy to share more information from our lessons learned. And with that, I will turn it back over to Allison. Thank you so much, Angie and Duane. And now we will have our final presentation from Dr. Wilson Pace from Dartnet Institute and Rock Serdar from Cloud Privacy Labs. Thanks, Allison. Um, so our project is called the Semantic Interoperability of EHR Data Using Layered Schemas Architecture. I just want to warn you, this is going to be a much more technical presentation than some of the other ones. Um, I'm a physician informatician, and Barack is a, a real informatician with a software engineer and the, uh, real, the real brains behind all of this construct. Um, next slide. So um, the problem I think everybody's fairly familiar with, EHRs store uh, a large complex set of data 
with lots of different ways that they codify it and lots of different underlying data structures just to give people that are most hopefully most people on the group are familiar but he, for instance epic contains over 22,000 uh, data tables and even a, a ehr designed for relatively small practices such as greenway success contains over 12,000 tables in the underlying databases that we're trying to get data out of for clinical utility and research um, we're working this is a project that is focused more on the population level kind of data. So we're looking more at bulk data extractions. Um, and that typically involves a bunch of idiosyncratic flat files uh, from the underlying EHR databases that is then either directly given to somebody to transform or is transformed locally into a data warehouse. A few people, you know, are transforming into standardized data warehouses. Now, more and more, um, but those also have their issues when you when you do that. We'll get to in a second. Um, there's recognized data extractions also that we want to enter, in, engage with, such as a continuity of care document architecture, uh, CCDAs, and I think if most people who work in the CTA world know, they say is if you've seen one EHR CCDA, you've seen one EHR CCDA. And there's FIRE, which of course, uh, in theory, supports bulk data extractions, but uh, so far we've not found any FIRE server people who are willing to turn that on because it tends to just drive their servers into the ground. So uh, we still use it, but it's not, it's a, a little less uh, apropos to our population-based data transfers that we're focusing on right now. Um, and, and underlying these, there's a lot of variability in what that data looks like. Um, and and typically what's going on today is that extract, extraction transformation scripts from all these different sources of data are developed locally. They're developed by each specific user and they're rarely shared and they don't have any underlying architecture behind them to make them easy for the next person to engage with. Next slide. Um, so the translation process uh, typically starts with an output in mind. So when I'm starting to stage my data, when I encapture it, I say, oh, what am I going to end up with? Well, I want to use OMOP or I want to use I2B2. Or I want to use Picornet. And therefore, my whole staging database and the whole first level process starts to move data into those different formats. As an example, we're an OMOP shop. We do most of our data into OMOP. In the end, there's about 20 tables that, that you end up storing your data in, um, really usually truthfully more around 14 that are mostly used. Um, and so you're moving data from 12,000 tables into, and you don't pull data from everywhere, in, into, uh, into 14 or 15. Um, and therefore, you, as you might expect, there can be data loss or the translational process is often lossy. Um, and the scripts are often tied to that specific terminology. Okay, next slide. So the vision of the layered schema approach is to create an ingestion and an output system that is database model agnostic, that is transportable, that as these ETL schemas and ETL scripts are developed for different input approaches, um, they can be shared, they can be easily introduced by other people. Um, that intrinsically supports many to many relationships um, and actually cuts down on the amount of work that has to, and the data that gets developed where those where those exist. Um, it allows multiple levels of multi -date, metadata to be linked to each data element, what type of data it is. It also allows security links to be linked to it. Um, and we think eventually it will provide new uh, insights uh, with the data modeling that we're, we're, we're going on. Next slide. Um, and then finally, uh, for that slide, uh, finally, um, at the time of ingestion with the data terminology tags that are applied, you can then output your data to whatever you wish. So one ingestion, if done correctly, you can then at the endpoint say, you know, I've got hundreds of data quality reports written in, in OMOP, please output this in OMOP for me so I can use them all and you can do that. Or I have mine in I2B2, put them out in I2B2. Um, We've had a number of use cases that are uh, bit, have been developed by our technical expert panel. We're going to highlight one briefly today and ask a question around it. And that is that if uh, if any of you work in the area of family 
kind of uh, research activities, maternal child health issues and uh, domestic violence issues or the impact of fathers or all these other kind of things that may go on in, in the social determinants and general research areas, you may know that it's very difficult to recreate families out of VHR data. Um, and so we will be, we are working on that within this uh, intrinsically power data is intrinsically supported many to many relationships because this is a classic many to many example um and being able to tag of whether the whether that information is deterministic or probabilistic and tag confidence intervals that can go forward for the next user so we're just giving that as a highlight of the use case that we'll be asking some questions about at the end um, and i'll turn it over to brock uh, yes thank you next slide please so the goals of our project is uh, the ingestion, semantic harmonization, and translation of data for coming from disparate sources and making this EHR and other health-related data ready for analytics and AI applications so that e multiple providers of multiple sizes can con contribute data into a research commons. Now, .NET is in a very unique interoperability uh, problem with this uh, in this project because uh, .NET collects data from many uh, providers and this data comes in many different uh, forms and shapes. Uh, they, they get data in different implementations of different standards so they have to harmonize this uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. So the main themes in our project is to be standard agnostic instead of adopt one standard and stick with it. Uh, the approach is to ingest and enrich the data with layers of metadata instead of ingesting it and translating it, normalizing uh, as on the way in, so, uh, so that we can provide researchers with data and metadata so that they can interpret the information better. So our job is to provide data and the metadata and not to interpret it so that the interpretation can, uh, can be more accurate. Next slide, please. So the, the high level vision is uh, something like this. We should be able to ingest data from uh, clinical data from providers, claims data, pharmacy data, social data coming from different organizations, from payers. We should be able to ingest data from uh, social services, education data, and combine these into a research data commons and then use this for AI and analytics purposes. And we should be, we should do this in a scalable and shareable, repeatable way so that other people can replicate the same process when they get data from uh, these sources. Next slide, please. So the data differs a lot. Even if you, call, even if you share the same information, the way that it arrives us varies a lot. These are some examples of the variations in structure. So fire patient comes uh, as it's seen on the on the left left hand side. There is flat files that come and in as uh, come as, uh, come as delimited files on the right hand side, and then the CCTA patient is at the bottom. So these are the things that we ingest and uh, convert into one common model, an intermediate model that contains everything. And we are using the uh, the common denominator of all these things, a graph model to, to represent uh, these kinds of structures. Next slide, please. Even if you structurally harmonize data, then there is variations in the content of the data. So there are different representations of dates. These, these date representations are all extracted from the same CCDA, for instance, or uh, the gender variations. Some uh, fire represents it in, in one way, CCDA represents it in another way. And if you go to flat files, it's, it, that there is really no standard. And the, the, even the terminology names, may differ from source to source. There are different ways to identify the same terminology, not just the terms, but the terminology names themselves. And there are measurement units. One CCD, one provider may give you units in, in, in the metric system. The other one may give you inches and uh, foot. So these kinds of conversions are the things that we are uh, working on. And for these things, uh, especially for the units, we are using like the unified cause for, for measure. Next slide, please. So the approach we are uh, using, uh, so the, the approach we are uh, using for this transformation is the layered schemas approach. This is a technology we developed a few years ago, basically to apply uh, to filter data uh, 
as it moves between systems to apply granular consent on it. And the problem there was we don't really know what type of data is being exchanged. So let's base it on the schemas, data schemas. But then the, even, the, even if you have the schema, the schema changes from, varia from provider to provider or the schemas may show variations. So you add additional semantic layers on top of these schemas so we can interpret, we can, we can account for these type of variations. And when you ingest the data, it can come in like fire CCDA formats. Well, it is really hard to deal with these things individually, so we convert it into, into a graph form, into a labeled property graph. Next slide, please. So here is a good spot to talk a little bit about graph databases and graph representations. Now, most of the industry is still working with relational uh, databases where you store data in, uh, in tables. That is basically data. You can search data on a relational database and you can test whether certain relationships exist in this data. Now, on a graph DB, you take it uh, up a, a, another level. You store both the data and the relationships between data. So you can search data, but instead of just testing for relationships, now you can search for relationships and identify relationships. So uh, that means if you link two concepts together, if you link two seemingly unrelated concepts together, you combine all the things that are related to that concept as well. So next slide, please. If you, for instance, combine, uh, if, if you combine two nodes in a graph database, all the nodes connected to those nodes will be combined as well. And then you can search for paths in the database, which are inferences on, on the, in the data. Instead of just searching and figuring out what the relationships are, you can actually search for those relationships. Next slide, please. So this is the overall architecture of our uh, project. We, the, on the input side, we have many different types of files. The STOH data added later uh, in the project, there was a huge demand for it from our technical expert panel. And we get these in spreadsheets in, uh, in flat file format. We have fire data, we have EHR data in spreadsheets. Now we write schemas for these files, especially for fire, we, we use standard schemas, ingest them using a terminology database into a graph database which uses an intermediate model, which you can then translate into OMAP or PCORNET or ITB2. And for this project, our, our focus is on OMAP. Next slide, please. So this shows the overall process. The input data comes in flat files. We use the schemas to ingest them and create this intermediate data model with the person at the center and the conditions, measurements, and observations are tied to it. This is not a fixed schema. This is more like a convention, uh, the, the way that we represent data in this way. So this can be extended in, in, in any way uh, we want. If, if we get different types of data, we can add another bubble there without making ma any major changes. Then from this graph DB, we create OMAP data sets, or this graph DB can uh, itself be used for AI purposes. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit more uh, detail of how this whole thing works. The prepare is a social needs survey, and this is captured uh, as a spreadsheet. Uh, uh, one of our partners gave us the spreadsheet where they captured the prepare data. This is... Uh, captured so that every row is an answer to a question by, by one person. And they use some internal codifications for questions and answer. So we write a value set, a value mapping for these things, and we write a schema that describes this kind of spreadsheet. And we translate this spreadsheet into uh, observations with OMAP concept IDs that actually map to certain low codes. So from one row of the spreadsheet, we end up with an observation containing OMAP concept IDs. Next slide, please. This one is an STOH 10 data. Again, this one is captured uh, using a spreadsheet, but this time uh, this provider captured it so that one person's answer is in a complete row. So this is a very wide spreadsheet containing all 10 questions. And we, again, write a schema and value sets for these. When we process one row of this, we create 10 observations, each containing their uh, OMAP concept IDs, which map the low codes. Now, the, the key point here is that the schemas and overlays and the value sets we developed here are shareable. And other people can 
pick these up from a GitHub repository or from, from some common uh, place, and then they can ingest this kind of data without writing any call, code themselves. So the ingestion from a prepare spreadsheet into OMAP or ingestion from a SDOH 10 spreadsheet to OMAP or fire to OMAP are encoded this way. Next slide, please. So even though we go through a graph database, this is what the out, this is the output we get. In the end, we get basically tables containing all the OMAP concept IDs. Next slide. And this is a more detailed vision of, uh, of our project. We should be able to get data from uh, disparate sources, from different domains, as long as we have the schemas for them. And we write uh, overlays for these schemas for matching them to their uh, providers for different variations. These schemas should be reusable. They are decentralized, so anybody can get them and maintain them. This way, we can ingest data into a research da data commons from where we can generate OMAP data sets, PCOR, PCORnet data sets, or I2V2, or directly use the knowledge graph uh, from, from this database. Next slide, please. Yeah, at this point, uh, can I get the screen so I show some of the examples? Yes. So I hope these are showing. So this is a, a typical graph database, and we, we are seeing three, three people's data here. So each of these little uh, blue bubbles represent three people. These are uh, data ingested from a fire, synthetic fire data set from the Synthes, MITRE Synthes fire data set. And this uh, purple dots here are the SDOH data that we incorporated into that fire data set. So this shows those three people. If we uh, look at this, like this is a graph database, and as I said, you can run queries on it. So this is a sample query that only shows the vital sign observations for these people. And uh, you can see these no these little nodes represent data points. So, for instance, this is this is by the mass index, and this one shows us that this is in kilograms uh, per meter square, and there, there are more detailed data points. And we have the OMAP mappings for the same uh, data point here. This shows that single person, and the orange nodes show our SDOH uh, data, and they are ingested as, so this, this is one observation. And as you can see on the right-hand side, it is also marked as an observation and an SDOH 10, so we know that this came from an SDOH 10 survey, and all the related data points are there. So this is a more detailed view, so this represents the person, and these are all the SDOH 10 related observations related to this person, and these are all individual data points. Now, I talked about a, a data model, so this graph shows the person of that data model. So this is the person, and these squares here represent all the data elements tied to that. And this is actually a much larger diagram because here, for instance, you can see it goes to conditions and observations, so it branches off of there. Now, this project has a public uh, GitHub site. On GitHub, you can, you can actually go and look at the source and all the examples uh, we have here. Uh, this is the the examples, the SDOH data that I showed you today here, this is the uh, example uh, spreadsheet that shows the, the survey results. We write uh, pipelines, data ingestion pipelines for this. This one is for SDOH 10 pipeline, and it is pretty self-explanatory. For instance, we can ingest the uh, CSV. We then do some graph reshaping to map that to our common model, and then we apply our value sets, the SDOH10 value set, and then we save it to the database. That's all that is. This is all the code we have for this pipeline. And this is what those value sets look like. So I talked about the variations. So these are all the different ways uh, people can represent a SNOMED uh, term. So these are all the different ways the loin terms can be represented. For instance, these are the female and male. And these are all the racial or ethnicity codes. And, and so this, this, in the end, this becomes the output. This is the OMAP output that we get from uh, this graph. So this is the graph, and this is our output. So thank you. This is, this is the end of our presentation. 
Thank you so much, Barack. And it looks like we have a couple of questions for you um, in the chat from Stu Gross. So he's asking if you use APIs and process automation to ingest and export data, and then where are the stored schemas available? Um, so I'll, for, I'll take the first piece of it because because Brock right now has been using various levels and samples of different kinds of real data and sometimes as you said synthetic data to develop the system. Dartnet, um, we uh, well last year we had we had uh, we had contracts with six thousand clinical organizations that sent us data on a daily to quarterly basis. We've cut back on that <laughs> recently, but um, that got a little crazy. Uh, 42 million people. Uh, we use all, all kinds of different interfaces. The one that if APIs with some systems and just uh, secure FTP concepts from vendors that, that do their own extractions. We have our own uh, data data software extraction software that we can put into systems that will download. And the one that's been, been used the least of all, interestingly enough, in our world has been Fire, um, because most of our organizations that we work with are small organizations. They don't have Fire servers available yet, and they don't do bulk work very much. So, uh, but we we're moving into more real time Fire. So yeah, we use all of those activities. I don't think this system has any constraints as it relates to how the data would be obtained. Um, I'll stop there and say, Barack. Um, yeah, yeah, that's correct. There that is, that is no constraints on the how the data is obtained. Once data comes, so this is a data warehouse ingestion process. We pass it through a command line programs to ingest the, and export the data. So yeah, that, it, yeah, there is no yeah. real automation there yet, as of yet. I'll just say that our that our AI person is out right now, but um, she's convinced that actually addressing the graph database directly where all the codification is, is at different levels, um, will actually make her AI process much faster and easier than having it go back down into her, a, another representation of relational database to create her tags and different things. So that's one of our major output tests is to see how what the ability is to address directly a graph database versus a working through a relational database uh, in a standardized format or uh, trying to do new activities. And there's another question about where the stored schema is available and they are in the GitHub. They are in that GitHub repository. And Wilson and Barack, did you also want to do your poll question now? That would be fine. Okay. Tom, can you pull that up? So the poll question that Dartnet had for everyone is family linkage info is lost in EHR data is using multiple data points such as guarantor phone number and insurance policy numbers to determine family linkage, an analytical activity, or should it be done at the data warehouse level during data harmonization? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I think the whole group is about where we're at on this one. <laughs> yeah. I think we get the construct, thanks. We're gonna play with it. We're gonna give it a try at part of harmonization. And we at least have a feeling that being able to visualize the relationships of multiple people, because within that, he showed you people that were all unlinked. But as you start to create linkages between those people, they'll show up in that graph database automatically. So we are hopeful that they're able to even visualize where linkages occurred that you may not even have known about um, very easily will actually allow us to be able to start finding um, groups of individuals within the data that may not be so easily seen from a relational point for you. So that's what we're, that's what we're going to be exploring in this, in this area. Great, thank you. 
And we have another question from the audience. Uh, Jessica asked that um, she's hoping that her state, um, Connecticut, can participate, and this is for the Missouri team, um, can participate in implementing um, this as soon as possible. So um, for the Missouri team, what is the timeline you foresee for rollout um, of this solution in Missouri and beyond your state? So I'll jump in with that question. You know, um, as far as our electronic case management system that our um, targeted case management entities or our case managers work with um, in developing general plans of care for individuals, I mean, that is going to be implemented uh, within the next 12 months. But as far as the full use case as presented, um, you know, that is probably more on a um, seven to 10 year trajectory. And, and I guess the analogy I would say is it's kind of like making a fine wine. Um, you know, when we're talking about a variety of providers uh, who have um, different levels of budget and different levels of familiarity uh, with electronic health records, they have different IT capabilities. Um, and we also have to ensure that, you know, individuals that we're supporting are well prepared and that we have all of our business rules in places and, and uh, you know, common language and what's being exchanged. You know, I mean, it really is one of those things where we're kind of at that point of cultivating the vineyards currently. Uh, you know, we've maybe uh, purchased some of the bottles and some of the corks, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not, a, uh, it's not a solution where we can just go grab grapes from the grocery store, put them in a bottle and cork it and, and, and have a wine that's going to be palatable to, you know, to individuals in short order. And so, um, so to me, it is one of those things that we're being thoughtful, incremental, and really looking at it systematically. You know, I, we're, we're taking care of some of the larger chunks. Um, but I think before we're really looking at full implementation, I mean, it, it, you know, it is more probably that seven to 10 year time frame before we would have something to be considered turnkey that I think another state can just pick up and immediately replicate uh, and, and implement. And, and I don't know if Angie has anything to, to add to that. And obviously the other big thing that I've not mentioned is you have to have funding. Um, and so, you know, it's about developing those uh, uh, cash flows, you know, to, to implement that as well. No, I really like that analogy, Dwayne. It is, um, Jessica, it is something that does take a lot of time. Um, I will be the first to admit that when I started um, hearing about value-based payments in the home and community-based setting, I was so excited because I came from kind of the managed care world and I was like, let's do this. Let's get this implemented right away. But because of the fact that there were not really the, the data elements, the data fields available, and that's what has most recently been put together in um, there's a lot of education around that. So what we have spent our time on is um, mapping those ELTSS uh, data standards to our, our individual support plan. And so you have to do that. So that took a year or so. And then over this next year, like Dwayne was saying, we're taking just a piece of the, the whole, um, the whole, I guess, um, movement to implementation of the ELTSS data center. We're just doing the use case component over this next year um, and, and implementing components of it. Um, we're not sure at this point that it's going to be the implementation of everything because our vendors are also learning, even FEI systems, because it isn't anything that is um, fully um, like required or, or in use yet. So we're doing a lot of discovery and we're hoping that discovery through um, our, our incremental steps of, of implementing this will be able to, to help the states. So if you want to reach out to us, um, we are happy to, to have conversations and kind of set up some calls and just share where we're at and the steps that we took to get there. Um, and then the steps that we know going forward over the next 12 months, you know, two years, it, it is going to take, like Dwayne said, quite a while for it to be fully implemented, but we can share with you kind of the steps that we're at. It's a very good question. Thank you, Angie and Duane. So while we um, wait for any other questions to um, be posted in the chat, um, we wanted to ask all of the presenters today, um, what are some of the ways your projects are making a difference in health IT innovation? And why is your particular work so important right now? 
And whoever wants to um, start answering, um, go ahead. I'm, I'm okay to, <laughs> I'm all right to answer fine. So, you know, the, the reuse of electronic data in general, we're seeing, I think all of these, all of these projects are all working and focused on better use of existing data. Okay. We are now, we are now buried in data, really. I mean, I go to so many of our IPA partners and things and they say, Wilson, it's not that we don't have the data. It's just that we don't know what the heck to do with it. Okay. We can't sort it. We can't, we can't standardize it. And, and everybody is off working on that side of it in their own silos quite a bit. And so our, and, and if you think about what's really moved things forward is where you see communities have come together. And I, I think of, of Linux, for instance, okay? So it's a community-based operating system that gets better and better or Red, Red Cap as a research activity. And ETL activities right now are highly siloed. And we think that potentially our, our so the system that Brock is developing would create a unified model or it doesn't matter what my endpoint is I want, I can share my, my steps with everybody else and we could create a community of ETL as opposed to silos of ETL. So that's why we think that could be, that then it would help Angela and everybody else who wants to connect all their data and standardize it um, uh, to, to not have to rethink all this each time they wanna get started. Yeah, from our perspective, uh, we believe that health equity is quite important, and uh, I think the uh, patient engagement technology for the sort of populations then become quite crucial. I think through COVID, we saw how many, much individuals that are underserved were deeply affected, and we believe that technology is a cause of that. Um, so. Yes, it's highly relevant. I think with the creation of QHIMS and the uh, national integration of data, uh, there's a huge potential here to really now open up data access, which uh, I believe has been really difficult for individuals for a long time. Um, so uh, it's very important. And I see that there was a question here on the chat, I think from Wilson anyways, about how hard it is to, to get the platform in a, another HIE. Um, it, it depends a bit, right? So if some uh, an HIE is uh, 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 fire ready, uh, it wouldn't be so hard, uh, but transforming data from uh, clinical data repository to fire may be heavy, a heavy lift for some organizations. Uh, I do add there, uh, based on your question, that uh, we use PPRL for the initial uh, research uh, aspect of such integration, right? So being in a research umbrella, we couldn't move all the HIE data through uh, to UT, to the medical school, without people's consent. So that's why we had to use PPIL. But in a real implementation like we have today, where patients come into the clinic and they are validated for their identity and then uh, they get access to the app, uh, the data is being accessed directly from the HIE. Uh, so PPIL wouldn't be necessary at that point. So we leverage the EMPI of the HIE. Uh, uh, we have for HIEs plus that are interested in going through a process now of deploying it. Uh, so it's not that heavy if you're fire ready. That even rhymes, I think. That's nice. I think for Missouri, um, the, really what's driving us is that we wanna see um, the quality of services for the people that we serve and to see quality outcomes. When, um, you hear CMS talk about it from a national perspective, the individuals that we serve in home and community-based services, um, they are the fastest growing cost of care in Medicaid um, with the smallest population in Medicaid. And then at the same time, we're not really seeing at the national level, we're not really seeing quality outcomes um, in, in the services. And so it's really, I think it came really kind of that push from, from looking at the um, the national landscape of this type of service and the and the and, and what the individuals are receiving and part of that has been I think because we don't have that data interoperability and the, the data connections and the components to be able to look at them from a whole person centered um, perspective. So when our home and community based providers are helping people keep them helping individuals stay in their homes they may not have the full perspective of what's happening on the medical side. So once you start to tie all that data together, then our hopes are that we see quality outcomes for the individuals that we're serving and then a reduced cost to the Medicaid system as well. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of 
where our, our push is, and it, it has been a challenge because it's introducing two completely different worlds to each other. Thank you. And um, in the interest of time, I know we just have five minutes left. I'm going to try to combine some of the questions we have um, prepared and welcome the audience, of course, to keep um, submitting questions through chat. But um, and and I think all of you have touched on this to some degree in your presentation. But we'd love to hear a um, little bit more about what are some of the lessons you have learned for those who might be looking to take this work further um, and collaborate or um, build on this in other capacity and, and scale this. Um, so um, if you could share a little bit about lessons learned and maybe also your hope and, and goals for um, achieving scalability as a result of your projects. Um, and whoever um, wants to jump in first can go ahead. I don't mind jumping in on this one. Um, lessons learned for us really was um, understanding the level of education that needed to occur on all sides. We didn't realize um, that there was there was such a disconnect between the programs, the um, the home and community based providers, and then the medical side and the IT side on on how the two um, systems work. Um, so we really had to slow down. And that's another lesson learned. It is okay to go slow. Take your time and really understand each other's world and how you can appropriately connect together. Um, so where we thought we were going to be moving a lot quicker, we did have to slow down and, and do um, several additional months, maybe even a year. We've actually been doing this beyond, you know, farther than our, our LEAP grant. We've been doing this for five or six years now we really had to slow down and, and, and do the education fully and to bring in as many stakeholders as you can. Um, that's where we really picked up momentum. When we started bringing on our general assembly, our all of our agencies that would touch on Medicaid, um, because until you get that room full of 50 or 60 people, at least, you're, you don't start making the connections on how you're really um, touching upon each other's um, products and services. and and um, services to the individuals. So a lot of education, take your time and really involve stakeholders. Thank you. And uh, before we jump to the next group, maybe um, we did have a follow-up question from chat on how do you ensure that data originating from district or city health facilities is protected? Um, so I think that's for the Missouri team. So that is one area that we are still working on because we, right now, we don't have the connection from the district and city health facilities. It's all within the state government. Um, so as we start to roll that piece out, we will have to ensure that, that we do have, have the, um, the protected data and with the business use cases, even within our own state agencies, we had to go through and do the process of reviewing all of our, our memorandums of understandings to make sure we had all the appropriate um, you know, PHI components in our agreements, um, which, you know, we, sh we should have anyway, but it was, it was a good process for us to go through to make sure we do have everything. Um, we are even doing that whenever we work with our um, state agency and voc rehab for employment services. So um, again, reviewing all of your, your agreements. Um, and then we will also have to work in, and this is in our, in our roadmap, to look at consent to share. Um, we've been working with, um, with FEI's team on that when they, they're part of Project Unify. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of that one, but Project Unify um, to, to kind of go down that path of that consent to share um, process and understanding um, what we need to do to incorporate that as well. Thank you. And I'm gonna kick it over very quickly to um, Darnett and UT Austin on kind of the lessons learned they want to share. I can, yeah, go ahead. Um, thanks. Uh, so for us, I think there are a couple of things that are uh, noteworthy. One is obviously what we have learned in engaging um, uh, communities more effectively uh, rather than just uh, you know nominally. And that has, uh, I think, assuming kind of what the needs are, especially for underserved populations, um, uh, I think it's uh, is wrong in terms of developing these solutions and they have to be engaged and we learned a lot from them. 
Uh, the second is that innovations, uh, they do take time and, um, and funds. And so what we have been able to do in two years has been able to demonstrate, you know, kind of a model. We have looked at the uh, technology, but the, from the input that we got from our community partners, uh, there were still um, features that had to be that have to be developed in order to make it really most useful to them, which requires sustained you know, funding. And the third is, I think that as uh, these topics uh, identify and lead, is that there aren't necessarily um, uh, strong market forces that are pushing some of these solutions because they are not necessarily benefiting those who are probably have the money in the system. So I think being able to identify how we make these sustainable and effective and efficient is going to be a challenge going forward. So for, uh, from our side, I think the, the, uh, the main lesson we learned is that standards really help with the interoperability, but they are not really uh, the thing that's, that's going to make it. Uh, there are the, all these EHR systems are, and the interoperability standards are based on data being entered by people and exchanging the data and then the data is being read by people and interpreted by people again. But what we are trying to do here is trying to interpret the data entered by people using computers, using AI or uh, those kinds of data sets. And we don't really have standards working well in that area. And we are hoping that this project is a step in that direction, in that level of semantic interoperability. Well, it looks like we have reached the end time of our session. So we wanted to thank everyone again for attending today. Um, if you had further questions for any of these projects, um, check the chat. We have um, the email address listed there for the LEAP program if you wanted to email Wei and I. And then um, we, I just wanted to make one plug for um, the next session that's starting at 2 p.m. if you wanted to hear about one more LEAP project. Um, the MedStar Fire Factories project will be presenting in the developing clinical decision support with SDOH data session. That's at two o'clock. So thanks again for everyone attending and um, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending. Thanks Allison for hosting this. Thank you to all of the panelists for your presentations. As Allison mentioned, the next breakout, breakout sessions start at 2 p.m and they can be accessed through the ONC Tech Forum platform under sessions.